Good morning. Ah. Uh, morning, folks. Showtime, I guess. So if you are in Nova Scotia or New Brunswick or BEI today, <laughs> it's a snow day for everybody, unless your classes are online, I guess. If you're somewhere else in the world, maybe you didn't have the fun we've got. Um, this was last night. Dora was out. She just goes crazy in the snow. Although this morning it's too deep for her to carry on the way she does. But, uh, anyway, so, but I had to add that in. Disappointing everybody else got to stay up late, watch the Super Bowl, and, and uh, then this morning have a snow day. Oh, well. That was a nicer day back in the fall. And, uh, uh, that looks like Frog Pond, given the ducks behind her. And here's a picture. It's a beautiful, I don't know if that's a sunset. Uh, and now I can't think of her name that sent up me uh, several pictures from around Corner Brook, Newfoundland. And they're just beautiful, lovely spot. So many beautiful places, you know, all around the world, all around the region. But uh, it is interesting that so many people send me photos that are sunsets. That are, I think everybody finds some very common, relaxing images. And... Uh, they feel comfort from it. Um, uh, sort of like I said, last class with pictures. When studying data, you feel pictures. Um, uh, yes, sunrises too. It's just, are you up early enough? I am with Dora. We get lots of good sunrises in our morning walk. But a lot of people are uh, busy making breakfast or whatever, not outdoors and uh, when the when sunrises are great um, but uh, I was mentioning last week when studying data if you've got it in a picture you feel it and that's really important it is the way we um, approach these sorts of things and your understanding comes from those emotional uh, reactions to them much better than the numbers as much as I love numbers uh, pictures are really great for that so a few things to get going. Uh, test two was a disaster, no doubt about it. The average um, out of the six sections, there were two, one of them being mine, that got just under eight out of 16. And the best section got almost nine out of 16, but didn't reach nine. So the average was, uh, uh, you know, slightly better than 50%. But that's, that's, um, I'm not happy with that. We spent a long time working on that test because last term, test number two, we also had low results. And so uh, redesign questions, rework them a lot. And there was a lot of back and forth among the instructors for a week trying to find ways of making sure that the language was clear and that the questions were not too nasty. Um, that, uh, But we failed miserably on that. So. Uh, I'm meeting, uh, I put the word out to the instructors and we'll be discussing it this week as to what uh, corrective action uh, should be taken on this. Uh, I guess the good news is that uh, you uh, always get to drop your lowest quiz or lowest test and put discussion in its place. And I think most of you are participating in those and there are lots of uh, I'm trying to have one a week. I'm struggling to find one to have for week seven at the moment. Um, uh, I'd like to have one on uh, Clearview AI, if you followed that story this week. And there are a few others in the news recently that are more about the ethics of data collection. Anyway, um, we also had several students that had technical issues with test two. Others, other types of issues came up with it and uh, either could not even start it or didn't get to complete it. And also I'm missing quite a few that didn't do quiz for chapter five. 
I'm going to be following up with you on that. I know several have contacted me already, but uh, I will be chasing you down on that. Uh, assignment two is posted, uh, and it's due Friday night. And remember, we've still got a quiz uh, on Saturday, and I'm reminded next week is actually our break week, which we could probably all use a bit of a break. Um, the uh, assignment two, I found a little bit of fun. I've used your data uh, from the survey from last year and this year. And uh, since we noted last time that you're studying a lot more than uh, the students last year did, uh, got me thinking, well, are we worrying more about your grades? Um, that uh, did all that studying, did it result in improved performance? Uh, are there any patterns there? Uh, so uh, we've gone and looked into uh, the uh, issue of grades and COVID. I think the good news, <laughs> except for test number two, um, uh, students have done incredibly well uh, this year. And I spoke with uh, about a dozen instructors at the end of last week in a meeting to ask them what they had seen in the fall term. And they did find as well that performance improved significantly. And uh, they didn't feel that they were giving easy tests or that there was rampant cheating going on or that type of thing. Um, it may be that COVID has forced instructors to rethink how they do assessment and how they design their courses. Because uh, there's it may well be that the teaching has actually improved because of COVID. And in turn, students are doing better. Um, anyway, maybe it's a good news story. Anyway, on with today. Um, uh, as I said, last day we did box and whisker charts. They're nice, simple charts um, that I'm going to use them again today. And I use them in a few times as we go on further in the course. That they, uh, on the one hand, I like averages because they're really, really simple and they don't have a lot of detail really to them, just a single number. And it's great for doing comparisons, but not everyone's average, so they may be hiding part of the story. But then when you put it in histograms, there's too much detail, and maybe it's too busy looking. Box and Whiskers try to distill that down, but looking at five numbers at once and doing that for several groups, if you compare four groups and five numbers on each, 20 numbers looking at them at once, you can't do that. We can generally only look at it about three numbers at once. So um, as numbers, not very good. But if you put them in pictures and you learn how to read those pictures, then you can start seeing the story behind it. And just to recap, the nature of it is a good study in psychology of the way we see things and how you draw attention to things. I know nothing about psychology, but these things do work with me. Uh, if the primary focus is the middle, make it big. Draw your eyes towards it. Use colors or scale to draw your attention to it. And that's what happens with it. And with a slice down the middle to show you where the median is. Now, I don't like the way Excel does it with the blue because I have trouble seeing that middle line. The secondary focus is who are the really low people and who are the really high people? bottom 25% and the top 25%. And doing them with just skinny whiskers clearly differentiates from the middle box because it's a very different mode that medium that you're using. Um, but it's also, um, it's, it's drawing your eyes out to those ends, but using less ink doesn't take away from the middle section, which should be the most important. The outliers have mixed feelings on. As soon as you put them in there, your eye gets drawn to them and you ignore the rest of the picture. You see these ones sitting way off on the side. But they are outliers. There's something wrong with them and they should be investigated. So it is like putting little warning lights on them or something like that. Find them. And then I appreciate that in Excel, I can then hide them and I can move on. But I should make a note to myself, go and investigate these, what happened. But this makes it easy to compare many, many groups at the same time 
And as I was saying at the start, you feel the chart. You don't read the numbers that are in it. You don't even look at the scale in it in many instances. You just sort of feel the pattern that's in it. So we're moving towards modeling at the moment. And we're going to be doing modeling initially using numbers. And this is a good segue into it because we're going to be looking for patterns and relationships. We sort of did that with pivot tables and pivot charts. And we'll do that more for categorical data, numeric or um, nominal data, that type of thing uh, later on. But um, with numeric stuff, that how do we explore these patterns that we've got? And so the we're going to look at value estimation. And this is one of the most common data mining applications we've got out there. It's trying to predict a number. And I'm going to use a data set that's credit card data. Uh, it's simulated data. It's not real. And the uh, let's just suppose our objective is to try to predict a customer's credit card balance. And is it like, why? Um, it is what it is. But we could use that if we had a model for different things. If we had a model that could predict what their balance should be under normal conditions, we could look for things that are unusual. So if the balance is quite unusual, for someone with that age profile and that income and other factors, then there's something going on there. Maybe it's customers that are about to default on their credit card. They're maxing it out and then they're going to um, uh, claim bankruptcy or something. Maybe there's criminal activity. There's something going on. Uh, these are also customers maybe that aren't using their card. Why? Maybe they lost it. Maybe it's worth a call contact them, um, offer them a different rate, give them an incentive to use their card. You want to hook them in. It's like trying to get them to start gambling. And uh, But maybe you want to understand who borrows and who doesn't and why. So again, you'd like to, if you could find the causes of borrowing behavior, maybe you can influence them. And again, if you're a bank, you want them to borrow more so you can collect more fees. And or maybe it's just one you'd like to do some classification. How do we identify customers that are likely to borrow a lot versus customers that are unlikely to use a card after they get it? That it's a classification problem. And then when once we know what type of group they are, and we could know this without them having a card, just on other information, maybe then we have a different way of trying to work with them. So there may be different reasons for building this model. It may not be to actually predict the balance per se, but do other things. So I'm going to try to do it using what we've done before. So before we would do comparisons across groups, like salaries among arts, business science students, that type of thing. So maybe I'm going to look at how does borrowing vary across customers with different credit ratings. I could group them into different risk categories that are they high risk customers they have a very low rating or are they very low risk customers they have a really high rating and how does that vary among the three groups that would be comparing through groups we've done that sort of thing okay and i could do that I could go and construct a pox and whisker chart so this one here uh, from this data set i'd find high risk customers they don't borrow a lot. See, it's down round zero. So maybe we don't let them borrow a lot, or maybe they're afraid to borrow because they've got bad risk. They want to improve their credit rating. But there are some that act like they've got a better rating, and they're a bit unusual. These may be ones we want to look at. Medium risk customers that they feel they can handle things better, and they borrow more. They carry a balance on their credit card. And then my really low risk customers that uh, they carry a fair bit, but then they're very, very low risk. I guess they have lots of money and they can pay it back. 
So yeah, it does seem to change as the credit rating changes. So that was helpful, I guess. But an alternative way of doing it is to do what we call a scatter chart. And I'll show you how to do this in a minute. So with a scatter chart, I'd have on one axis what their credit rating is, and on the other axis what the balance is. And for each customer, I've got one data point. And I'd show each of these data points here. And some people like one type of chart, some type of the other. Do you have any thoughts? If you can use the chat, do you prefer one chart over the other? Does one tell you more than the other? Uh, are they both about the same? And there isn't a right answer. Different people like different charts. So when you say one gives more correlation than the other, which one do you think gives more correlation than the other, Patrick? I like the scatter plot. There are a lot of people like scatter plots. I loved them for ages. Until I started, I went backwards and did these types of box and whisker charts. And it helped me. And I'll show you what happened to cause that sort of thing. That if, well, let me go back. This is 400 dots. Suppose I had 40,000 credit cards. What would your scatter chart look like if I had 40,000 dots here? Any thoughts? What do you mean too clustered? Crowded, what do you mean by that? Scale would stay the same. I just got a lot of them. Yeah, my data is going to start overlapping. I'm going to get, like you see here in the middle where it's really jammed up, it just looks like blue. That's only with 400. If I had 40,000, I'm going to get a solid mass of blue in the middle. But also, the bigger the sample, the more likely I'm going to get outliers. So I'm going to get some really high ones, some really low ones, and a lot of them. So actually, I'm going to have a blue band that might end up just being a big splotch of blue. And I wouldn't actually see the pattern as well. Whereas if I had 40,000 and I was doing this, what I'm going to get is some outliers. And then if I suppress them and just look at the box and whisker, the box and whisker will actually stay the same. That the uh, box and whisker doesn't change that much as you get really, really big data sets. But a scatter chart can become very confusing. Well, I could actually. Well, why do I need to plot all 40,000? If 400 are enough to see the pattern, why not just plot the 400? So if I, that's all I want to see in the pattern. You've got to think about what you're going to put there. So with very large data sets, sometimes the scatter chart becomes like this big splotch. And the box and whisker chart really doesn't change under that. There's a way out of it, though. I could just say, don't plot all the data or make the dots tinier. <laughs> Make them little tiny, tiny, tiny specks, and that would deal with it in some fashion. But there are some people that do like the box and whisker. They find it simpler in certain respects, and they find the scatter chart is just too um, too much going on. So let's go and do this in Excel and move to Excel land on this. Now, actually. I got to go and get the data set. I forgot to, if you don't mind me, here's my pictures. Yeah. I just was grabbing these before class. So you'll see all my screen here. Now I've got, can't remember where I put the data, but I'll find it. That's the one I want.
Okay, okay. So let me make this a little bigger and let me bring you back. Bring my data back. There we are. Got all the pieces together. So this is this data set that we're going to play with. And it's got a variety of variables. It's got an ID number for each one, which is always helpful. It allows me to put my data set back in order again if I mess it up. For each customer, I've got their income in thousands of dollars. So 14.891 is actually 14,891. I've got their credit limit on their credit card. Um, it's the customer has a credit rating that's out of a thousand. Um, most credit ratings are not on that same scale. Uh, I've put those into risk groups, these high, low, medium. How many credit cards they have, what the person's age is, how many years of education. So uh, 12 is just finishing high school, and 15 would be three years of college or university. Gender, male or female. Are you a student? Yes or no. Are you married? Yes or no. Your ethnicity is Caucasian, Asian, or African American, and what the balance is on the credit card. Now, this is an American data set, but it's not even a real data set. It's a simulated one um, created by a fellow called Gareth James for a uh, book he co authored on uh, an introduction to statistical learning. So it was on data analytics. Um, uh, a tough read. <laughs> it's, it's, you, you need to know your theory well. Uh, but he made it up for just examples on things, and it turns out to be a really nice set for it. It doesn't seem that unrealistic, but uh, you could guess, like credit rating, you wouldn't have it as a or credit limit. Um, it's generally to a certain, you know, five hundred dollars or thousands of dollars or something. You know, credit limit of three thousand dollars or. $4,500, it isn't just some funny number. So um, the uh, uh, um, I encountered the data set by accident online one time. It took me months to track down the source because it was interesting, but there was something strange about it that um, I couldn't believe it was real. Anyway, that here's my data set, and I would like to look at credit rating, that's my column D, and I'd like to look at the balance owing. So I select the two columns, okay, and then I go up to insert and recommended charts, and normally it'll guess a scatter chart, and I click OK. So here's my chart. Okay, whoops, excuse me, what's wrong here? doesn't want to do anything to me Go that way then so within the chart it grabbed the second variable I gave it and made it into the title I'd suggest you go and actually put your title in here I like a title that tells a story so um, uh, I might say those with uh, Better credit rating or more. So if you were doing this, and this is a communication tool, that you want your reader to look at the title of your chart. You may have to bold face this or move it around so that they pay attention to it. But so that it's the title should tell them what you want them to see in the picture. So as soon as you state this and then they see the picture, yeah, okay, I can see that. It makes sense to them. Don't just say um, borrowing versus credit rating because it's just, yeah, but why am I looking at this? Why did you give me this picture? So you should, that this is all storytelling. My axes aren't labeled, so I should go and label those and try to get into these habits. So axis titles so i'm going to add an element to a chart on the horizontal i want to call this credit rating okay and on the vertical axis you 
There we go. And whoops. And I'm going to have this as being balance or credit card balance. Uh, personally, I don't like titles that go up and down. Uh, makes it hard to read. Depends upon how long the title is. This one isn't overly long. I would right click it. And I should be able to format the axis title, it says here. And hmm, what do I got here? What's that? I don't know. What's this? No, it's this one. There we go. Text direction. I want to change that. I want to make it horizontal. There. I like that better. But that's a matter of preference. Okay. And for me, it's keep it. I find this keeps it simpler. So this is an example of a scatter chart showing that pattern that you've got here. Before I run away, because I'm going to go and look at a variety of these scatter charts, suppose I wanted to look at um, some other pair of variables. Um, suppose I um, wanted to look and see... Um, do older people earn more money? Okay, something different. So I've got income and I've got age. So I'm grabbing two columns and I could go and insert and do my charts again. Yeah, it looks like a scatter chart here. Okay. And this becomes my picture. Now, I don't know if you, now, I'd like to know as age goes up, does income go up? And notice what I've got here. It's already given me the clue. It put age as on the vertical axis. So is that really what I wanted? No, I wanted to know as income go up, as age goes up. And that's not the right way. Okay? That normally we want on the vertical axis, what we call our dependent variable, the variable that depends upon the other one, when we think there might be a causal type relationship. And on the horizontal, we're trying to look at the, like the X variable on the horizontal, Y variable on the vertical. And Excel doesn't give you choices in grabbing those. When you grab two columns, I grabbed income and age, it put the first one is being X, the second one is being Y. Before I had rating and balance, so rating was X, balance was Y. Good, that's what I wanted. But this is not the way. And I know the natural thing, what I always want, oh, let's just switch them. But if you do it, you're going to get garbage. It, it says, no, yeah, no, I can't do that. And it's because... These aren't rows and columns. These are switching axes. The only way I can do it is to actually move the variables. I would have had to go and take income, copy it, make a new sheet, and it's, let's say, paste it into my new sheet. Oops. Yeah, that's not it. Here's my data again. Do this again then. There we go. That's income. I need to read. And I would have had to go back here and I wanted age before. I grab that column. It in. They don't have to be side by side, but this X comes first, Y comes second. Then I could take the two variables and I could go insert. And I'm going to go and have a chart. And this one says income. That's what's on the up and down. And this is age on the horizontal. Ages go from early 20s up to almost 100. Okay. But if you seen the previous chart I had. This is like if I thought this was age on the horizontal, I've got ages going from about 10 years old up to 
um, 185 years old? No, probably not. I, I mess things up. So first warning is with Excel, when we're doing this, that we've got to be careful about the sequencing. And I probably have that in my slides. There we go. Um, that the variable on the vertical axis has to be to the right of the one on the horizontal. Sometimes Excel doesn't like me selecting labels. This one, I grabbed the two columns and it worked. But there are times I've gone in Excel to go and put, I don't want that. Let me just get this guy out of my way. And I went and took the rating data and I took from rating on down. So I didn't just grab the whole column. I, I actually grabbed values. And let's see if it does it properly this time. And uh, balance. Oh, <sighs> stupid me. Excuse me. Let me do that again. Now, it may work, it may not. But I've had mixed success with Excel when I've grabbed labels in doing charts. Um, when doing box and whisker, it would sometimes treat the label as if it's a value. It wouldn't know it was a label. Let's see what happens this time. Oh, it did do it right. Okay. So um, sometimes it's nice and it works, but it doesn't always. So sometimes I'm cautious about using labels when I'm doing that. I can always insert them afterwards. And we went through, we made our chart. So those were the different things that I went through. And as I said to you, that go and add various elements like a title and put um, the uh, labels, uh, titles for the different axes. So you know what it is that the picture tells you. And very often people forget to do those types of things. Um, in quant one, where we had often make you do charts and things, often students wrote X and Y and I didn't know what X and Y were. And what are you describing on the horizontal? Oh, that's number of units and vertical axis is dollars. Okay, now I understand what they are. That so I might ask, how does the balance vary with some of the other variables like income, credit limit, age, years of education, number of cards? I can do all of that, and I've already done it. Okay, So I've got a whole bunch of pictures. Hopefully you can see these ones. So this is the first one with credit rating. Looks like it's sloping uphill. Here's with income. Do people with high incomes borrow more money? Mm, yeah, some. But people with low incomes borrow a lot too, relatively speaking. That, um, that what about your credit limit? If you're allowed to borrow more, do you borrow more? It looks like you do. Okay. That if your credit limit is up around twelve thousand dollars, you're going to borrow more than your credit if your credit limit was two thousand dollars. And you notice that most of these people are borrowing less than two thousand, so it's not like they're borrowing to the limit. But if they're allowed to borrow more, um, they have more room to borrow, then they do so. Do people that have a lot of credit cards put more on each card? Or, well, on this particular card. And I don't see a pattern. That if you have lots of credit cards, it doesn't mean that you put a lot on this specific one. Do old people borrow more or less than young people? Doesn't look like it. They're all over the place. Here's my 98-year-old guy. Seems to borrow the most, but um, maybe he figures he's not going to have to pay it back because he's not going to live long enough to do it. I don't know. Um, live dangerously. Years of education doesn't seem to have any role to play. So we've got different variables. We can look at these. If you want to play with some data that may surprise you, I'm trying to work on your assignment three at the moment. Uh, look at the data set you got for assignment two and ask yourself if you studied more hours, would your grade point average look better? 
Is there a pattern? Those that study more have higher grades than those that study less. How about if your high school average was higher? Would you do better in university? Look at the pictures. Not as strong as you might think. That, but that raises the question, what, some are strong patterns and some are weak patterns. Can we actually come up with a measure of strength? Do I have to go through a whole bunch of pictures? If I had data on you know, 50, 100 different characteristics of my customers, sifting through it may be tedious looking at all these pictures. Is there a simpler way of sifting through, of ranking which ones have strong patterns and which have weak ones? So, and someone mentioned before, correlation, which is a word we're going to go and actually define. So, how do you measure strength of a relationship? And there are different approaches to doing that, but there's one that seems to be the standard. And it dates back, I don't know, probably the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, somewhere around there. Carl Pearson put it together now. Even when he died, it was probably early 1900s that he came up with a measure that has now become the de facto standard. So where did it begin? That started out looking at splitting my picture into four quadrants. Okay, that, And the way I split it is I looked at what is the average credit limit? The average credit limit was around 4,500. That's where the vertical line is here. And the average balance owing was around 500. So there's my line horizontally. So it's not smack in the middle of my picture because I've got so much data down here, it pulls it down. That this data is very skewed. That if I looked at credit ratings, lots with low ratings and then a few with very high ones, and balances lots with low ones and a few very high ones. And so down here, this is someone with a below average limit, a low limit. Uh, it's the average I'm using the, the mean value, uh, that not the median. That medians are nice for like block plots and doing pictures, but when you start getting into formulas, nobody uses it. It's they use the mean value. Um, you're not going to have to calculate this, thank goodness, okay? Don't worry. I just would like you to have a good sense of where it comes from. It may not be intuitive, but this is a thing that you will see frequently, and you'll often see correlations as numbers, as we'll see in a minute, often stated. And it's useful to have a sense of what is it and what isn't it. So I've got a lot of points that are down here in the negative negative. I've got some that are in below average credit limit, but they borrowed a lot. So they didn't have a good rating, but they like to borrow. I've got ones over here that have a really good credit rating, but they don't seem to be borrowing. And then these that have a good credit rating and they're borrowing. So it's above average in both respects. So I I've got these pluses and minuses. If I looked at uh, age and the scatter, you would see that I seem to have lots in all of the quadrants. The average age was around 50, and so under 50, over 50. We didn't see a pattern in this one, but we also see a fairly broad spread in all four quadrants. Going back, the one we had before, very much concentrated in the bottom left and the top right, much less so in these other two. So, when we looked at variability, if you can recall that, um, we had measures called the variance and the standard deviation. They're not, I don't find really attractive because uh, they took squares and square roots and, and all kinds of odd things, but they measured how far you are from the middle. Are you well below average? Are you well above average? So let's look at it in both respects. Are you below average in terms of your credit rating and below average in your credit card balance? Or are you below in one and high above in the other? Are you a lot below or a lot above? Look back to your picture. So these ones here 
are going to have a lot of pull. They're far below average in terms of their credit score and a very, very low balance. These ones out here are going to have a lot of pull as well because they're far above average in terms of their credit rating and they're far above average in their balance owing. So when you looked at that pattern, these ones drew your eye and those ones did. If you chopped them out, you wouldn't see that pattern there. So our eye is being very much drawn to these ones at the ends that are having so much pull on things. Well, um, what would happen if we looked at the product of how below average you are or above average you are? in your credit score and how above at times how much above average or below average you are in your balance. This is different from just taking values and squaring them. Remember we took deviations and we multiplied them by themselves. So we got rid of negatives. This will actually make negatives. Okay? Because if you're in the top left, it means you've got a low credit rating, but a high balance on your card. When I multiply that together, I'm gonna to get a negative times a positive, which is gonna give me a negative. But if you had a very low credit rating and a very low balance, I'm gonna get a below average times a below average, minus minus, when multiply gives me a plus. So if I went back to my picture again, there, these ones, negative times negative, all of those products are going to give me positive numbers. Positive times positive, these are all going to give me positive numbers. And I said there's a lot over here and a lot over there. So all those positives are going to add up to a big positive number. But then I'm going to be offset by some negatives. Here are negatives there, but they're going to only pull it down a little bit. So the total of that is going to be a positive. But this one, they're going to balance each other out. My negatives and positives are going to cancel, and I'll probably end up with a total that's close to zero. So there is a measure that's called covariance. Variance was deviations from the mean squared averaged out. Finance people like it. Finance people also like covariance, that it's these how do these two things change at the same time? And it's measured like a variance is. Uh, finance people, what do they look at? If they were looking at a picture, they're looking at how has the stock market overall gone up and down? Is its changes look like? Is the market gone up, the market gone down, that type of thing. And then they're looking at a particular investment stock. Did it go up when the market went up? or down when the market went down? Does it follow the same trend? Or some investments go the other way. When it's a booming stock market, they go down. When the stock market is going down, they go up. So they're, they have a negative covariance. But um, when looking at overall risk, variability of stock returns, they like looking at variance. When looking at that pattern of fluctuation, how does it change as the stock market changes? They look at covariance. But you'll see this when you hit finance. It's hard to wrap, wrap your head around because these are such strange numbers. They're, they're not things we'd look at. But remember, this thing could actually be that the negatives outweigh the positives. And our pattern is going down. If our pattern went downhill, then most of the dots are in the negative neg in the, the negative boxes, a negative plus or a plus negative type thing. It's hard to understand. So um, many people like what's a big covariance, what's a big variant? They go and scale it that because uh, the covariance depends upon your units. If you measured um, balances in dollars or thousands of dollars, you'll get a different covariance depending upon your units. But if you divide through by the standard deviations of the two, you will actually scale things. And we're not going to go through the theory, but
but it ends up giving you a number that's between minus one and plus one. And that's what's known as a correlation coefficient. Now, it's given a special name, uh, the Pearson's product moment coefficient of linear correlation, some great long name. Everybody just calls it correlation. There are other measures of correlation, uh, not nearly as commonly used. Generally, when you hear someone talk of correlation, they're talking of this messy formula to do it. But I would never make you do this. Uh, Excel does it for me. Okay. And but just before I show you how Excel does it, it's useful to have pictures so that you know 0.86. What does 0.86 look like? That's a number that, and we'd like to be able to feel the number. Just like temperature, um, what is 10 degrees? Well, how do you feel when you're, it's 10 degrees outdoors? And also you need to know what scale it is, Fahrenheit or Celsius or Kelvin, that with these numbers, have a picture in your head, what goes with that number? So if the highest correlation I get is a one, which is a perfect straight line going up like that, this is 0.86. So there's a fair bit of scatter still there. Here's 0 0.086, so a number that's very, very close to zero. And you can see there's nothing to speak of. Here's the one with income, where it looked like there might be something, but it was hard to tell. Correlation's 0.46. So like I would have thought, if someone asked me, and I knew nothing about correlation other than um, Plus one means a very strong pattern between two things that it's going uphill. And zero is like a shotgun blast, like this here. There's just nothing happening. And minus one is like a perfect line going downhill. Okay. And then they showed me this picture and said, what's the correlation here? What number would I pick? Honestly, I would have picked something like, I don't know, 0.5? maybe 0.6, but I wouldn't pick 0.86. This seems really high to me. If they asked me, what's this one? I probably would have said, I don't know, 0.1. It looks really noisy. I can just barely see something here. So maybe it's only 0.1. It's actually 0.46. It's very deceptive what the pattern is between these correlation coefficients and what the pictures look like. And I think people sometimes think, oh, I've got a really strong pattern with a correlation of 0.46. And many people would say that when in fact I'd say, you've got what? I barely even see it. Pictures help. So a few others. Here's a negative correlation. It would be very close to minus one. Be 0.9 something. There's still scatter here, but it's going to be very close to one. What do you think about these two? Any thoughts on those two pictures? What sort of correlation we've got? There's a couple people typing, Keegan and Noah. No correlation. That positive for the first one? Yeah, you almost think so but it, it's actually, it's zero because it measures linear correlation. It's as I move from left to right, is it slope up or does it slope down like a straight line, perfect straight line. And this one, well, it looks to be going down, but then it looks to be going up. Overall, it's really just a straight line across. And this one, I know it looks like it ends a bit lower here than it started over there. But in fact, the correlation is very, very close to zero. It's a, a horizontal line. I don't know if overall Y goes up or goes down as X gets bigger. It sometimes does, sometimes doesn't. So it correlation coefficients don't measure pattern of curves. They only measure patterns of straight lines, which can be problematic. How do we deal with curves? We'll look at that later. But uh, with um, uh, remember that it's 
if you get a correlation that's close to zero and you haven't looked at a picture, don't immediately say there's no relationship. It's just there's no straight line, no linear relationship. Um, I don't like the word linear because I, I like straight lines. I, I, I never associated the word linear clearly enough in my head with a nice line. So um, as I said, they're straight line relationships. They're quick and easy to calculate using Excel or some other software. Okay. And so if I've got a lot of variables, I could go and look through them quickly and see what's the pattern or which ones seem to have a strong pattern, which have a weak pattern. But again, I can only see straight lines. And this will come up several classes ahead. That Watch out for outliers. Um, this was my first major mistake with looking at patterns and without looking at the data. Now I had a large, relatively large data set. Uh, this was before um, graphing type computers were available to us. Um, so I was using computers that I said were as big as my house. And I ended up with a very, very, very high correlation. It was so high, it was just too good to be true. So I went back to one of my old professors and said, I, I can't believe this is too good to be true. And we examined where the data came from. And in fact, my data set was composed, um, I can't show it here, but of two, um, well, maybe I can show it in a minute. Let me just show you what I basically had. I'm gonna just insert, uh, can I, where's some, uh, where are shapes, client, windows, symbols? Hmm. Oh, well, I guess I can't right now. Anyway, um, that, I'll do it later. I had two clumps of data. I had one very large mass of data that was just like a ball. And then I had another group, and I didn't realize uh, another group that was very different from everybody else that was just sitting off in space by itself. It, it was relatively small, but it was far away from everybody else. And it was like, here was the sun, here's a moon or, or planet or something. And when I looked at those two, when I tried to find the correlation, of course, they all fit into these two quadrants, this bottom right quadrant, this top left quadrant, when I looked at averages. And I just put, I connected these two blobs together. And what I had to realize was that there were actually two groups. I needed to study the two groups separately. And that within each group, there was no pattern whatsoever. But the two groups made me think there was because of certain variables I was looking at. That, uh, so outliers can be, uh, they have a lot of pull. And even in our scatter chart, those ones that were out at the ends tended to draw our eye. They tend to draw the correlation. In doing this in Excel, it's a pain. Um, Excel's, I mean, I'll go and do it first, and it's going to give me an error message. So um, let me just get this out of my way. If I wanted to find what is the correlation between rating and balance, I could go to data, go to data analysis. Where are we here? There we go. And there's one called correlation. Click OK. It asks, where's my data? Oh, OK, my data is here. And it's here. And it's in columns. And I've got labels. And I'll put it in a new sheet. OK. And I get an error message. You probably can't read this, but it says, correlation input range must be a contiguous reference. If you aren't familiar with the word contiguous, get out your dictionary. It means these two columns had to be side by side. I can't have all this junk in between the two. So if I want to look at it, I've got to have them both together. So to do that, normally what I've got to do is take the data I want to study, move it into a new sheet. Okay. So 
um, let's cancel that out. What I did is I grabbed all of the columns with numbers in them and I put them in a new sheet and I called it correlation. Whoops, I'm giving you the answer. Let me hide this from you. We'll do it in a second. So I've got ID, income limit, rating cards, age, education, balance. I could go into data once again, go to data analysis, ask for correlation, and it asks, well, where is my data? Well, my data is, well, I can grab column one if you want. Um, let, me, let me grab everything all the way to balance. Grabbing all of these, these are all numbers. Okay, and I click, oh, uh, and I'm going to put it into the same sheet. If you don't mind, just so we can see it all. Up here. All right, it gives me a table of correlations. So, balance is the thing I really want to study. And Correlation between the ID and balance is 0 0.006. Nothing. Nothing at all. Balance and income, I showed you on a picture before, it's 0.46. So somewhat better, but as we saw, it's a pretty broad scatter. With the credit limit, it's quite high. Uh, we saw that in our scatter diagram. It looked sort of like the same scatter diagram as rating. It, so it also has a correlation of 0.86. So both of these ones have a very strong pattern between uh, with balance. Number of cards, no, nothing. Age, nothing. Education, nothing. In fact, it's slightly negative. Oh my God, someone just drove down the hill. Um, looking out my window, I live on a steep hill. Yeah. If you look at others in here, we've got, we could look at, this one has given me, what's the correlation between income and credit rating. So people with higher incomes seem to have a higher rating. I guess that's what it means. People that have, look at rating and limit. If you've got a very high credit rating, they give you a very high credit limit. Look at that one in a minute. Um, so all of the pairs, it'll give me their correlations. Between credit limit and itself, if I was to plot credit limit versus credit limit, they're the same numbers twice, I get a perfect correlation of one. So on the diagonal, I always get a one. If I wanted to find what's the relationship between uh, credit rating and credit limit, it's up here. Whoops, no, that's income and limit. Um, that, um, where is it? Rating and limit, here's limit and rating, it's going to be the same thing as this one. So limit rating is the same as rating limit. They just flip. So that's why this table is all blanks up here, because it would be the same numbers twice. Um, this is the highest number we've got to a one. So let's just look and see what that looks like. So here's limit and rating. Um, I'm just going to probably want to show this the other way around with, so this has rating on the vertical axis and limit on the horizontal, but look at that thing. It's almost like a perfect straight line. So if you're trying to picture what 0.997 looks like, that's what it is. It's almost like someone drew a very crude straight line. That again, when you're trying to picture these things together, that should give you a rough idea of what it's going to look like. I should warn you, I didn't put this, I don't think, in the notes. But just as a caution, oh yeah, you're going to have trouble uh, with the data set you've got. You can do a plot of your grade point average versus your high school average. But you won't be able to find a correlation with the data set you've got at the moment unless you do some house cleaning. Look at this file that I've got. Anything you find striking about it compared to your survey data? OK. 
keep keep scrolling down and there's no blanks you got it exactly mia with survey data we've always got blanks and so it makes it uh, painful to work with if you have any blanks in your data when you do those calculations in the formula and remember we had a you know behind the scenes is a formula so just remembering where all this stuff comes from if you were doing the calculations suppose i gave it to you and said do the calculations how would you do this when you've got a value for credit limit but you don't have anything for balance not a zero it's a blank i can't calculate it i can't do the calculations so the stuff we're going to be moving into next with a lot of the formulas and a lot of the stuff from here on in we start running into problems with blanks if i've got any missing values my formulas just collapse they don't work that when we had excel do things with pivot tables and there were blanks it ignored the blanks it just didn't include them it worked out averages based upon all the values for which it had the numbers for it so um but as we get into these more sophisticated tools blanks are a major problem with your survey uh i did go and look at it because uh, i was curious um and uh i cleaned it and i ended up having to throw out over a hundred records so there were 556 survey responses between last year and this year and i i threw out about 20 percent of the data because they were missing something for what i wanted to look at i was looking at our studying grade point average and your high school average uh and hours that you spent doing recreation activities i think i think that was it because they were simple numbers i could um look at but to find correlations I ended up having to throw out at least 20% of the data, which is problematic uh, because maybe I've thrown out important information. There are strategies some people use. They've got a blank, they might fill the blank with an average. So if I didn't know what your bank, what your credit card balance was, I would insert the average balance and presume your average in some fashion somewhat dangerous doing that it tends to force more points into the middle but um they you may not want to throw away 20 percent of your data it's it's valuable to you um but you're distorting things because you're assuming someone is average when they're probably not average they're different everybody's different in some fashion so back to where i am I've got all these correlations and from them I can start if I was starting to build a model and next class that's what we'll do is start building a model to predict what the balance is and I've got to figure out which variables are important in my model and which ones aren't and if I was looking at it I'd say income the credit limit credit rating but these other things probably are not useful pieces of information and so I'm not going to use them but um, the other three are going to be useful to me and that's where I'm going to stop today um, that so looking at these different sorts of charts they give me an idea of what variables I should be using in my model I'm going to be looking at um, uh, correlation as being a useful thing if I've got to if I could only pick one thing to use, then I'll pick the one with the highest correlation, generally, because it's the strongest pattern. Generally, we're going to be building models incrementally. I'm going to include one variable, credit rating. Okay, now I'm going to go back and see what should be the next one I'm going to add in. And I'm going to use correlation to give me an idea of who should be added second, and then who should be added third. And that uh, as you do the adding, though, you may want to think about building a team so if you were building your hockey team it was a pickup game of hockey 
first person you picked was, oh, this person's an outstanding goalie. I'll have a goalie first that I'm confident in, um, that I'll think in those terms. And then you go to pick the next best player. Well, the next best one might be also a goalie, but you've already got one. So you're not going to pick a second one. You're going to be picking someone that's, that's better at scoring. And then as your team builds, you're going to look at what are the gaps in your team. And you're going to add in those sorts of things. And that's actually the strategy we will use in building our model is like building a team. That, um, that correlation coefficients, though, are very much going to be players in assisting us in building up our team, building our models. But these ones uh, in building it may be somewhat mechanistic. It's We've got so much stuff there that we'll frequently be just looking at numbers to give us a quick idea of what to do next. And as I've said, I find correlation coefficients to be very deceptive numbers. Even people that do a lot of research, if I show them a scatter plot and ask them what the correlation might be, or I give them a correlation and say, what would the scatter plot look like? You know, is this a strong pattern or a weak pattern given the correlation? Their answers are generally wrong because they've they haven't thought in terms of associating the two together. That so um, oh we've done the finding the correlation in Excel, but what I want to start doing is building a model, and I'm going to start out building linear models and uh, building straight line type models. So if I was looking at um, let me see which one I've got here. Uh, not that one. Is that the one I want? No. I want one that has a nice... Let me just go back and insert a picture here. There we go. So the next step we're going to do is we're actually going to take this and just won't let me there we go I want to put a straight line through that and what's the best line I could put through that scatter you know the finding it I can cheat in Excel I can actually make it draw a line for me and that's what I'll use initially starting out even if you can't see this line very well That's the best line it's going to say that goes through that scatter. And what I'd like you to have an understanding, just like I wanted you to have a vague understanding of what correlation is, where it comes from, because these are numbers that are frequently used. How do they determine the best line to put through a scatter of points? And you might think, yeah, that looks like a great line. But I might also say, oh, no, I, I can freehand a line better than that. That one, I just, I would much rather a line that goes something down a little bit. And again, let me uh, make mine nice and big and fat so I can see it. I say, well, why not that line? Or maybe something that's even a little bit gentler. Why, why isn't this the best line? Why is the orange one the best line? Or, okay, okay, maybe it should be a little bit higher than that. Why can't I move that line around? How do I decide what is, in a sense, best in terms of the best line through a scatter? Because honestly, when I look at this orange one, it just doesn't, it looks okay, but it, it troubles me what's happening here and it troubles me here. And you may also start thinking, is it really a straight line I should be using? And that's one of the other issues we'll get to um, over the next few classes, but not until well after the break. Okay, and I guess we're going to call it a day at this point. I will be following up and getting back to you, hopefully by Wednesday, as to what's happening with test two. Uh, again, those grades are very disappointing. They aren't in line with how you've been doing on the chapter quizzes, um, on quizzes three and four. Uh, the grades were quite good. They were like nine out of ten was the average. Um, so I was expecting... Okay, not 90% on the test, but 
maybe at least 70%, not 50%. So we will examine that and see, did we mess up in designing the test? Or did we mess up in prepping you for that test? I don't know. And uh, I'll have something to report on uh, Wednesday. And if you didn't write the test or it blew up on you, uh, or you didn't do quiz five, you'll probably be hearing from me, uh, probably not today, because I got to get it shoveling, um, but probably tomorrow sometime. Anyway, take care and uh, enjoy your snow day. Bye-bye.